be here tonight, and uh, thank you uh, to the group for inviting me. This is a prestigious monthly uh, occasion that they have, and they brought in some really amazing speakers, and so I'm honored to uh, follow in the footsteps. I will tell you, though, speaking of uh, speakers and presenters, if you Google my name, uh, you will find a different kind of speaker, and uh, about eight or nine years ago when I was doing a little more public speaking before my principal career started, I got a call uh, from a lady, and she was from uh, Brookfield or someplace down there, and she said, is this Mike Mothy? And I said, yeah, sure is. She said, I'd like to book you for a Sunday afternoon. Okay, all right, and I said, that's fine. I said, how, uh, what time? Two o'clock, and she said, is it, is it okay? Uh, we're gonna do it uh, at my house. And I thought, okay, I talked to a lot of confirmation classes, and so, you know, some parishes like to do it in different places, that's great. You know, just like the early church, do it right in somebody's house, life is good. And I said, that's, that sounds good. I said, anything anything in particular do you, that you want me to talk about? Or And she said, no, don't you just have kind of a usual? I said, Sure. <laughs> and at the time, most of the talks I was giving in the Milwaukee area were like chastity, how far is too far, that sort of thing. So the Sunday uh, arrived and I drove down to Brookfield and I find the address and you know, there are a number of cars on the street. So I thought, okay, I have the right place and walked up to the house and I knocked on the door and this very nice lady answered the door. and. Uh, she said, oh, she said, you want me to grab my husband to help you carry your stuff in? And I, I thought she meant like, you know, a projector or, and I said, no, I don't, I just, I'm just gonna, you know, talk. And she said, she said, uh, are we supposed to provide the stuff that you juggle? <laughs> <laughs> the other Mike Mothy is a magician and a juggler. <laughs> he lives in uh, North Western Indiana, and she had 50 first graders in her backyard <laughs> waiting for the magician. <laughs> I know one magic trick, and it's like hold a rope with both hands, and there's a knot when you untie it. It's literally all. So she felt terrible that I had to drive, and I felt way worse for her for what she was going to have to experience. So, so if you're here for the juggler, I have bad bad <laughs> Anyway, thank you again, and thanks for, uh, for coming out tonight. I think we live in a very challenging time as Catholics, and this topic is timely in that, in a lot of ways, the early Catholic Church struggled to identify itself against a world that saw things much differently, against a world that was maybe opposed to what the Catholic Church stood for, maybe apathetic, but at the very least, and not terribly open to the message as it first started to take shape in different communities uh, around the, the known world at the time. And in a lot of ways, as we look at modern Catholicism, we face similar challenges. We live in a time where we encounter people who hear the message of our Catholic faith, and some are radically opposed. Many, many who identify themselves as Catholic themselves, are painfully apathetic. But we are, in a lot of ways, uh, the other. And while that can be a barrier, and it can be an obstacle, I also believe that it's an opportunity. And so, what I'd like to do over the course of this next little bit is just talk a little bit about the experience of the early Christians, and most especially, how they went from uh, small communities of people to a world force, and not so much as a history lesson, but as a personal evolution. So what has to happen in my own life in order for me to take the message that I hear about this person, Jesus, and be transformed into a person who wants to evangelize in the rest of the world? And as we walk this journey, I would challenge you to consider what it would have been like to be in the sandals of those early Christians. It's easy for us today to think about 2,000 years of church tradition. It's easy for us to think about a predominantly Christian society and a time when uh, the Catholic Church has been powerful for our lifetimes and many before us. But imagine how differently we would look at our faith if we knew the world the way the early Christians did. And so that's my challenge tonight. There will be times for us to 
reflect on a few questions, either by yourself or with neighbors, or I guess if you want to yell out answers, I can't stop you. But I really want this to be a process of personal reflection. What can I take uh, from the early Christians? And if you will uh, bear with me, I'd like to just open with a prayer. And this uh, prayer is from St. Irenaeus, who we'll be talking about just a little bit. Irenaeus, uh, second century, a great thinker. And we'll talk about uh, his transformative great thought. The font is small, so I'll read it. But if you'll uh, join me in remembering that we are in the holy presence of God, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is not thou that shapest God, it is God that shapest thee. If thou art the work of God, await the hand of the artist, who does all things in due season. Offer him thy heart, soft and tractable, and keep the form in which the artist has fashioned thee. Let thy clay be moist, lest thou grow hard, and lose the imprint of his fingers. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, let's talk first about what the world would have been like for the early Christians. Of course, there were lots of Christian communities in lots of different places, so I'm just going to make a few generalizations. I think most of the times when we think about the early Christian community, the first word that comes to mind is persecution. And of course, there's validity to that. Certainly, early Christians were persecuted all around the world. Uh, I'm not sure that it was as uh, uniform and as dominant an experience as probably we 2,000 years later remember. I think without doubt there were periods in which uh, Catholics lived sort of under the radar and there were times in which Catholics were uh, just sort of left alone. But persecution has its place. I'd like us, though, to keep in mind that probably the most significant experience from the perspective of the rest of the world would have been of, of the apostles and the early followers of Christ as a new sect of a misunderstood faith. The Roman world didn't really understand Judaism that well, although they respected it because it was ancient. So when they looked at Christianity, they just saw a new sect of something that they didn't understand to begin with. It wasn't like, hey, this is the thing we're worried about, there goes the Roman Empire. It was like this small cult of people under this bigger umbrella that we don't understand. And so what led to a lot of the persecution was the suspicion of being other. And this isn't exclusive to Christianity, of course, certainly not to Catholicism. We think of our own, uh, the 20th century, and the experience of uh, members of the Jewish faith in the Holocaust. The experience of being other almost always puts you at odds with your neighbor. Almost always makes people suspicious of your motives and what you're doing, and they don't understand. And you think of some of the traditions that we hold today. When we go to Mass and, and Father says, this is my body, take and eat it. While that is incredibly spiritual to us, that is suspicious and otherworldly to someone who takes a different approach. That is something that's not easily understood by your common member of the Roman world. And so as Catholics set themselves apart from their neighbors with their rituals and with their sense of community, this suspicion of the other group what I love about the early Christians is they looked at that suspicion of the other and said, let's use that. Let's be radically different. Let's start by relying on one another, community. And then let's expand that by our generosity. Reach out to the poor, to the orphan, to the widow. Let's be known as those people who will take care of anyone. In many of these communities in the early church in the 1st, 2nd, 3rd century, if you said the word Catholic, probably the first thing that some of the neighbors would have thought of was service. Service to others, and not just others in the Catholic community, others in the civic community. I think there's something to be learned from us, for us today from that message. And I mention that because when we talk about how the church spread, when we talk about the steps to evangelization, when you really look at Acts of the Apostles and the letters of Paul and the writings of the early church leaders, there's a lot of theology, and we're certainly going to get to that in a couple minutes, but it starts at places where everyone can understand. It starts with some really basic things. And the first is be generous. 
the very first thing that the early church knew to do was to reach out and say, we can help. Acts of the Apostles talks about this a number of times. There was no needy person among them. They took everything they had and shared it in common. That doesn't, some people read that and think like, oh, Karl Marx, where are you? Not what they meant. They meant we have these resources and if anyone needs it, you can have it. They meant it's about us, not about me. That doesn't mean I didn't have my own home, I did. But it's about us. And if you need a home or if you need food, you know where to find me. In Acts, he talks about that communal life. In 2012, uh, a study was done, you might have heard this before, but on average, we Catholics give least among all Christian denominations. And when they studied further, they said the reason is because Catholics need to be, quote, spiritually engaged with their money. That unless we see a connection between our mission as Catholics and what we give, we tend to see our material life and our spiritual life as two separate things. Nothing could have been further from the experience of the early Christians. Nothing could have been further from that. Everything that they had belonged to the community because that would be the only way for the community to really thrive. We rely on one another and we reach out to others in need. On a brighter side, the same uh, sociologist found that Catholics do service at a much higher rate than any other Christian denomination. We do service more, we give money less. There's probably some psychology in that, but I'll leave that for next month's speaker. Uh, we still have the remnants of that idea that the very first act of evangelization after Pentecost was to establish these communities that served one another and looked outward looked outward. Think about your own parish life and the number of ministries that are outward looking. Not about the survival of the people of St. Mary or the people of St. Pius, but about the survival of everyone in our community. That has its roots in the early Christian community. The second thing was hospitality and unity. There was no room in the early church. There was no room for division. There weren't enough people. And imagine trying to convince people that the message of Jesus was a real one if you couldn't agree about what the message of Jesus was. There was no room, so unity needed to prevail. Pope Benedict, in, a, in an encyclical letter in 2005, said, Love of neighbor grounded in the love of God is first and foremost a responsibility for each individual member of the faithful, but it is also a responsibility for the entire ecclesial community at every level. It's not just my job, it's our job as a parish. It's our job as Xavier High School. It's our job as the Catholic Diocese of Green Bay. It's our job as the worldwide Catholic Church. Love needs to be organized if it is to be ordered service to the community. Love, charity, how we take care of one another. It's biblical, it's one of Paul's favorite topics in the epistles. He talks about this idea of service to one another, of charity to one another. And imagine the powerful witness that that example would have been in the early church when you were a member of the Roman community and you were looking at this small group of Christians trying to figure out what makes them different, but why are they so united? Why are they so in communion all the time? Why are they singing and staying together and eating at each other's houses? What is it about them? And then they go out and they serve. We see people like that today and we think, that, that's a life I could live. There seems to be happiness there. So it must have been for the early Christians. We have so many of these stories of martyrs who die and in their death, they are more joy-filled than most of us are on the average day. You know, it's like your favorite TV show is preempted by 15 minutes because the football game runs over and you're screaming to the heavens and they're martyred, and they're joyful. Be united. Emphasize hospitality. So this is where it starts. For the earliest Christians, for those who knew the apostles, or those who knew those who knew the apostles, or those who were three generations removed, it starts with the way of living. It starts with the way of interacting with one another. 
church is about one another. It's one of the things that sets apart the Catholic faith from many of our other uh, Christian brothers and sisters is that sense of community. It's about our relationship with God, not specifically mine. My work isn't done if I have a relationship with Jesus. We have a relationship with Jesus. And that leads to the third part. And probably the thing that, as we look back, we identify most with church history. And that is, as we go out and try to evangelize, we have to be able to know our faith. We have to be able to know the faith that we share. I cannot tell someone else, tell someone else about Jesus unless I understand Jesus myself. And we've done a lot of talking about Jesus, but let me tell you, in the year 100, the question of who Jesus was, that wasn't a given. In the year 200, not a given. The Council of Nicaea is in 325, it produces the Nicene Creed that we have today, and that battle goes for another 125 years. This is individual people saying, everything that I am as a Catholic depends on me knowing who Jesus is. That's at the root of my entire understanding. Everything. The sacraments, salvation, the afterlife, everything that it is to be Catholic is wrapped up in the first question, who is Jesus? And then once they got their heads around that one, then they started to ask some other kind of important ones, right? How does Jesus save us? What do I have to do to be part of that salvation? What role do the sacraments play? What happens after I die? What's my life supposed to look like? These are all questions that we can go to the catechism or we can read church documents about or we can search for what does Pope Benedict or Pope Francis have to say about X. In 200, they had to write those church documents. In 325, they had to host a church council to discuss these matters. And so the early Christians weren't going to Google, as amazing as that would have been. <laughs> the early Christians weren't even headed down to the library. The early Christians were going to the people in their community who were the founders of the Christian community of their city and saying, tell me more. I need to understand this. And in that act of knowing Jesus better, they found that passion to evangelize. And so I want to walk through just a bit of that process uh, tonight as we strive to understand the early Christians and their passion for evangelization through the lens of coming to know Jesus better. That's the big question. The question that people would ask those who did believe, who is Jesus? What did he do and why is he so special? The question for those who already believe, who is Jesus? How well do I know him and how can I share him with those who are alive? In the theology world, we call this Christology, right? It's the study of the person of Jesus, who Jesus was and what it means for us. Why does it matter? Some people will take these questions and say, these are just obscure theology. I don't know. All I know is I believe in Jesus. Trust me, it really, really, really matters. If you want the Eucharist to be life-changing, transformative, the source and summit of our faith, you have to understand who Jesus is. If you want Jesus to be the Savior of the world, the one who brings us to God for all time, you have to have an understanding of who Jesus is. And that's exactly what the early Christians went through. Now, there are sort of two perspectives. One commonly called uh, high Christology or, or Christology from above. This is the idea that when you think of Jesus, you really sort of think about God. You think about God coming down in the form of this human, but you tend to emphasize those parts of Jesus that are more on the divine side, right? The Jesus who walks on water, the Jesus who, uh, to, I, we have a basketball game tonight just on the hall. The smell of popcorn is not to entertain you during this, but, um, <laughs> And I was just in the gym before I came in, and our athletic director showed me a cartoon that was sent to her today. And it was, it was Mary and Jesus at bath time. And Jesus is on top of the bathtub walking on the water, and Mary is pointing, saying, in, in. <laughs> I'm not 
suggesting that that cartoonist was taking a Christological position, but he's suggesting this sort of high Christology. It's the Gospel of John when John starts out and says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word... This is a really, like, Jesus was always there. Jesus and God were together, and it certainly is true. But it really emphasizes this sort of Jesus as he's different from you and I. And in the earliest centuries of the church, the emphasis was on this part. And it probably makes sense. What made Jesus different from all of the prophets of the Jewish faith was this suggestion that Jesus wasn't just another guy coming with a message, but he was the guy. The big guy. He was, in fact, God. And if we could just take a second to think about how ridiculously transformative that idea is, the thought that God, God's self, would come down and take human flesh, that's not what anybody was thinking of when they said Messiah. The thought that God, the creator of all, would take this limited, questioning, sometimes less than perfect, eventually dying human body? Maybe that idea of the Incarnation, maybe the most unique thing in all of early Christology, that God would love us so much to deign to come from being all God and say, I will be all God and all man. Pretty amazing. <clears throat> Take it to an extreme. This idea can be a heresy. So uh, the heresy of Docetism says, well, God is too great to be like in one of those things. So God must have just pretended. It looked to you all like Jesus was human, but that was actually God just taking like a human appearance. Because there's no way that limitless God could be like limited. There's no way that unchangeable God could change. And so taken to an extreme, there is heresy here. God made man, Emmanuel, God made man, made man, not appeared man. And we'll see how that uh, affects the early church. The other side, just as a side note, would be a low Christology, Jesus from below. And this one has become much more popular in the last few centuries. This is really an emphasis on Jesus' humanity. I don't want to say, though, that it's only recent. This is Mark's perspective. If you read Mark's Gospel, Jesus is as human as human can be. That doesn't mean he's not God. But Mark's emphasis is on making Jesus like us. We talk about like us in all things except sin. That comes from the Jesus that we know in the Gospels. That comes from uh, some of these people that we're about to meet in the early church. That too, taken to an extreme, can be heretical. And we'll, we'll talk about Arianism in just a moment or two. I just want to stop uh, before we go further and say a word about <laughs> about heresy in the early church. Certainly, it is a fair position that there are people in the early church who we consider heretics today who were obstinate, who were not working for the right team, who wanted to glorify themselves or not God or all of these things. I don't doubt that to be true. For the next half hour, though, I would like to suggest that perhaps it wasn't as easy to come to know Jesus as we might assume today. That perhaps in the early Christian community, these wrestling matches over who Jesus was were legitimate people with questions, like you or I might have. They were honest, questioning, I don't understand this, it doesn't make sense to me kind of people. Probably the kind of people that a lot of us experience in the world today within our Catholic faith. They weren't necessarily people who were close to the truth. They just couldn't see it. Not all. Certainly some were close to the truth. But what we call a heresy today, at one time was a dispute between priests, or between bishops, or between thinkers. It was not, here is 2,000 years of church teaching, and you're really evil. It was... We have to figure out what we mean when we say these things. And I hope that if there's one thing you can see tonight, it is why these, why the truth matters in the end, but why it wouldn't have been quite as easy as maybe we perceive today. 
So on the way in, uh, you possibly grabbed a pink sheet. It has several creeds on it. At least a couple of them I hope are familiar to you. I didn't hand it out to insult your intelligence. I just wanted it for you to have as reference because I want to point out how you can see the, hist the development of the idea of who Jesus was through the creeds themselves. We know with good certainty that the Apostles' Creed is the oldest of the creeds. And if you look at it or you recite it from memory, think about how straightforward and simple the part about Jesus really is. It describes what happened in Jesus' life without much else. Right? There isn't a ton of deep theology. It talks about Jesus being born, of course. It talks about Jesus being crucified, being died, being buried, and mentions descending into hell. That's unique. But it is a description of what happens in Jesus' life. And it's four lines, five lines, the part about Jesus. That's the earliest creed. We're probably talking first, second century. So the people who would have made the Apostles' Creed, either the Apostles themselves, or people who literally learned from the Apostles, they are testifying to what the Apostles told them happened. This is not an extravagant theological statement. This is a description. And it would have been the description that the earliest Christians would have used to summarize their faith. This is how Christians for the first, I don't know, three or four generations after Jesus, this is how they understood the faith. But it leaves some room for interpretation. The first person I want to introduce you to is uh, Irenaeus, who uh, was the author of our prayer tonight. Irenaeus lived in the second century AD. He's a student of Polycarp. You might say, who cares? Polycarp was a student of St. John. So Polycarp learned from the guy who learned from Jesus, which means Irenaeus learned from the guy who learned from the guy who learned from Jesus. Which doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal, but that's really pretty close. Because we've learned from the guy who learned, I'm not even going to go there, but there's a lot, right? So to be, to be just one person removed from a guy who walked with Jesus is to be connected. He was a bishop in what we would call France today, known as one of the fathers of the church. And I mention him because Irenaeus was faced with the, with the heresy of his day called Gnosticism. Probably many people have heard of Gnosticism before, so I'll go fast. The Gnostics thought that everything physical, everything material was evil. Think of a sin, any sin, don't yell it out, don't make it your most recent. <laughs> Think of a sin. I bet it's physical. It comes from your hunger or your desire for more material things or your jealousy. I bet it's attached to your body and your mind. The Gnostics said that all material stuff is evil, and especially the body and everything human. So Jesus, because he was God, could not have been really human because humanity is evil. See, the Gnostics said what really happened is Jesus took on the appearance of a human so that he could come and give this secret knowledge, Gnosticism, this secret knowledge. And if you know how to perfect that knowledge, you'll be able to get your soul released from like the prison of your body and to God. But the apostles, they didn't perfect the knowledge. They were on the road, but they didn't perfect the knowledge. Gnosticism, maddeningly popular for way too long, if you ask me. This is what they taught in the words of St. Irenaeus. He said, they taught that there's one unknown father who made angels, and everything in the world was made by those angels. <laughs> That's heresy, just so you know. You can't say that. <laughs> they taught that the Savior was unborn, incorporeal, not, didn't have a body, without form, Asserting that Jesus was seen as a human being in appearance only. And if you don't believe me about all things physical being bad, they thought that marriage and procreation were from Satan. <laughs> How we keep the human race going, that's for a different time. <laughs> so this is what the communities, this is what the early Christians were faced with. Their neighbors saying, oh, I think you've got it wrong. I don't think that God could really be human. That leaves the big question number one. Just 
30 seconds of reflection. What would we lose in the Catholic faith today if we dismissed the idea that Jesus was really and truly human? If we stepped aside and said, okay, maybe Jesus just appeared to be human, what would we lose? I'll give you a couple seconds. Okay, that's all the time I have. <laughs> Think about everything that's attached to Jesus being really and truly human. You cannot have the Eucharist if Jesus didn't have a body. It would be, this bread is similar to something that I appeared to be when I, that's not that powerful. <laughs> if Jesus wasn't really human, then Jesus doesn't know what you and I go through. He didn't suffer like we suffer. He wasn't tempted like we were tempted. He didn't doubt like we doubt. To say that Jesus isn't human is to take everything that we use to connect to Jesus and say, not really. He faked it. That's a pretty big loss. To say that Jesus isn't human is to say that the resurrection never took place, because if he wasn't human, then he never died. By the way, if he wasn't human, he wasn't born either. Everything that we have starts with, was Jesus really and truly human? Irenaeus is in this great spot. I love this guy more than anyone, I think. Irenaeus says, here's the deal. Let me talk first about the hidden mysteries. If there was this secret knowledge, if the Gnostics are right, and, there, and Jesus came to pass on this secret knowledge, who would have been the one group of people that he made sure had that secret knowledge? Probably the people who followed him around every day, who at the end of his life he said, hey, you got the keys to the kingdom now. Right? The people who he left in charge of his church would have been the one group that he said, make sure you've got it right. I'm leaving you in charge. Irenaeus says, not just that. But once the apostles were getting to the end of their lives, who would they have made sure had that knowledge after them? The people who were coming after them? The bishops and the leaders of the communities that were established at that time? And when those bishops were getting old or getting to the end of their ministry, who would they have made sure had that knowledge? The next bishops? And Irenaeus in a much more poetic way said, hey fellas, Guess what I am? Bishop. <laughs> Guess what I don't have? This secret knowledge. Jesus wouldn't come and say it's a secret. Nobody gets it except for these random people out there who found 200 years after I came and died, found 200 years after the value in this. Jesus would have left it in the hands of the bishops, of the apostles and then the bishops. He said, if you need to evaluate something to see whether or not it's the truth in the church, look to the earliest Christian communities, especially those founded by the apostles. And what better Christian community to look to than the one founded by Peter and Paul? A lot of people call that Rome. And that's why the Bishop of Rome is pretty important in the early church and the medieval church and the modern church because the bishop of rome would be in unbroken succession all the way back to saint peter himself to the church that peter and paul founded irenaeus 150 170 ce establishes the rules that we use today if we want to evaluate whether something is true let's look at how the apostles understood it and how those who were apostles to the apostles understood it now if you look at the Nicene Creed, this is right at the height of Gnosticism. Look at how different, look at how different the Nicene Creed is in terms of its theological development. You'll see why I'm part of it in just a second. But notice, uh, notice when we talk about uh, Jesus, we get to this entire section by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. By the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. And then we go into the next paragraph. The bishops in the, in the fourth century knew that this 
question was out there about was Jesus really human? It's its own special part of the creed because it's so central to everything else that we see. Irenaeus is the guy who gets us there. He is the guy who protects the Eucharist for the early Christian community, who protects the idea that the resurrection is the life, the passion and resurrection of Jesus is the transforming event for our salvation. He protects that with this idea. And the early Christians come to know these things through the teachings of their local leaders, just like Irenaeus in France. What do we learn from him? Be faithful to sacred tradition. It's, you can read it in the Bible. It's not necessarily as straightforward, by the way, if you were living in 130. Chances are you didn't have the Bible like we have been sitting at your bedside. Uh, that God will inspire and protect those to whom the deposit of faith is given. God watches over God's church even today. This is a great little Irenaeus thing. He says, you know, if it's new, it's probably not. If you think you understand Jesus better than the apostles did, probably wrong. And you say God doesn't deceive. What you see is what you get. God doesn't fake it. If God comes in human form, what we have is a human being. That leads us to the other side of the coin, uh, St. Athanasius. Athanasius lives, I'm cheating a little bit because I'm on both sides of the Council of Nicaea, but it's not church history night, that's fine. Uh, he was uh, an African bishop and known as a doctor of the church. But Athanasius uh, faces the other side of the coin. We call that Arianism. I mentioned it before. Arianism is the heresy that Jesus isn't God. Arius said, see, there's only one God. And so God is the creator of everything. And Jesus could be the greatest thing ever created by God, but Jesus is creator. He's a creature, not the creator. Arius says, this is his quote, he says, God existed without beginning, before the Son. The Son has a beginning, but God is without beginning. If that rings a bell, check out the Nicene Creed, you'll see Arius lost. <laughs> kind of bad. And it's Athanasius uh, who corrects him. This is an Arius, this is a guy named Paul of Samsona, but it's an extension of the Arianist belief. He says, the Spirit of God descended on Jesus based on the sanctity of his life. Jesus was just a God. Just a holy God. But as God saw how holy he was, God thought, I'm going to give you this kind of special power. That's heresy. At the time, that was the kind of discussion that the Christian community had to undergo. What do you mean when you say Jesus is the Son of God? What does it mean in the Gospel when Jesus says, I and the Father are one. What? What does that mean? That leads to the big question number two. How would our Catholic faith be different today if Jesus wasn't God? If Jesus was just a really holy man upon whom the Spirit came down at his baptism and became blessed with the power to do miracles and be resurrected, if Jesus was just God's greatest creation, but certainly not God, how would the Catholic faith be different today? Well, since I'm a big Eucharist fan, I'm going to start there again. If Jesus is just a creature like we are, there's nothing powerful about the body and blood of Jesus. If Jesus is just creation, then the power of the Eucharist is lost. You can still have the body and blood. But the power of it is gone. If Jesus is simply a creation, then Jesus can't save us. How does Jesus make stuff right if none of the rest of us could? If Jesus isn't God, of course, then there isn't a trinity. Then the Father, Son, Holy Spirit thing looks pretty ridiculous. So there's lots tied up potentially here. Athanasius literally delivers my favorite theological line in all recorded history. Athanasius says, you can see by the way Jesus lived, that he was both human and divine. And if you ever thought that Jesus' spit would be the topic of theological discussion, here it is. Athanasius writes about Jesus, he spat in human fashion, 
but his spittle had divine power. It's so great. <laughs> he spat in human fashion, but his spittle had divine power. From by it he restored the sight of the man born blind. That's Athanasius in a nutshell. He says, for all of you who are struggling, for all of you who are like, well, maybe Jesus doesn't have to be God. Everything that the apostles came to know and understand was that Jesus was in fact divine. Not just like us. Just like us in our humanity. Radically different than us in his divinity. Look at all of the stuff that Jesus did. You try. Athanasius says, the gospel's witness to the reality of Jesus' divinity. It must be. He says, he's using Jesus' quote now, he says, when he willed to make himself known as God, he used his human tongue to signify this when he said, I and the Father are one. It's a pretty small thing, right? He said it as a human. You watched his lips move. But what did he say? I and the Father are one. Not, the Father made me, I'm like number two in command. I and the Father are one. Now to us today, we might read this and say, yeah, I get it, he's human and he's divine. Put yourselves back in the shoes of the early Christians and think about how important this would be to them. They're building the faith. They're building the theology of the sacraments. They're building the mass. They're building the, the entire, what we would call the catechism, and say the entire structure of belief. They're building all of that. And it all comes from this basic question, who is Jesus? Now, look at the Nicene Creed again. Look at this great string of begotten, consubstantial, all. literally the Council of Nicaea says, we've got to put it on paper. We've got to make sure that people understand that when we talk about Jesus, we're talking about God and man. When we recite the Nicene Creed every week and we say, um, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, Every one of those lines is saying, yes, he was God. Light from light, not light maker shines a light. Light from light. True God from true God, not lesser God from the God. True God from true God. When we say the creed every week, we should hearken back to our early Christian forefathers and think about the struggles that they went through to understand what it is that we often take for granted today. What does Athanasius tell us? Without his divinity, Jesus wouldn't have the power to save us. None of the rest of us could die and restore us from sin. It was because he was God. So as Jesus' own words, as understood by the apostles and passed down, tell us we're talking about God made man. Picture. St. Gregory of Nazianzus is a doctor of the church from the 4th century. I know, I'm getting late in my uh, promised time frame, but I can't help it. St. Gregory is addressing a heresy called Apollinarianism, and Apollinarius said, here's the deal. Jesus can have a human body, but he can't have a human mind. You see, the human mind is like, mm, kind of naughty. We tend to less than holy thoughts sometimes. You, you know, you sort of hope that your neighbor who just got that new, new car accidentally backs into the garage. <laughs> God can't think that. And so uh, Apollinarius said, here's what must have happened. God came down and took on the human flesh, but he kept the mind of just God, his flesh, was still, you know, like yours and mine. He cut Jesus' skin, he bleeds. But his brain, see, that was, that's all God. That's a heresy. Thanks to Gregory, primarily. But the importance of Jesus being human in mind as well as body, this goes back to the suffering question, right? Suffering is a mental thing. If Jesus only has the mind of God, then he doesn't know what it's like to suffer like we are, like we do. If Jesus only had the mind of God, then it wasn't a free human choice to give his life for us. Having a mind that is really human and really divine is very important to our 
theology as well. Gregory, there, <laughs> let me just say, much theology is written in a way that is a little edgy, a little personal. And so uh, Gregory says, if anyone has put their trust in him as a human being lacking the human mind, they are themselves mindless and not worthy of salvation. Okay? <laughs> loud and clear, loud and clear. Don't think that. Gregory says, we do not separate the humanity from the divinity. And here's my favorite part. He says, for what has not been assumed has not been healed. This is such a beautiful idea. For what has not been assumed has not been healed. If Jesus doesn't take on all parts of humanity, if he doesn't assume a human body and mind, then he can't heal all parts of humanity. In order for us, to, for him to heal us of the weakness of the flesh and of the mind, he needs to assume the human flesh and the human mind. On the back sheet of the other two creeds, <laughs> if you've ever seen the Athanasian Creed before, I think it doesn't take long to realize why we don't recite this one at Mass very often. <laughs> but just peruse the first paragraph. Athanasius didn't, in fact, author it. We don't think he actually authored the Athanasian Creed. It was most likely authored by his uh, followers. But just look at how long you go in that creed emphasizing Jesus being entirely God and man. Mostly, <laughs> in the first paragraph, entirely God. But you could read for about an hour uh, before you get past this, like, no, we're serious. Really God and really man. This is probably, I think most scholars today would tell you, this is probably, what, a 5th century, maybe early 6th century, um, this version finally came to be. Think about the fact that this discussion is still so prevalent in the early Christian community that over 400 years, when they sit down to write the creed, this is the most important point of emphasis. And then just look at how long it goes. I always chuckle when I'm at Mass and I or someone around me stumbles over the Nicene Creed, like they start to say one in being with the Father and we're all saying consubstantial, and it's like, what are consubstantial with the <laughs> Can you imagine what that would sound like if we were with Athanasius and his creed every week? I don't know. First of all, Mass would be an hour and a half, but that's fine. Um, I mention these creeds because I think it's important to understand how much this question of who is Jesus dictated the theology of the early church. And important to understand how much it should dictate the way that we live as Catholics today. When we talk about evangelization, it starts with the person of Jesus. What are you trying to evangelize people to? I hope it's to love for and pattern their lives after Jesus himself through the teachings of our Catholic Church. But that starts with understanding of who is Jesus to me. When you think of Jesus, do you think of that human being suffering in the garden the night before he dies, that human being on the cross forgiving those who persecute him? Do you think of the glory of the resurrection or of the walking on water or of the turning water into wine? P.S. I get that the turning of the water into wine is Jesus' is like public, like, hey, I'm here for real. But do you ever stop to think about Mary clearly knew something was up, right? <laughs> they run out of wine, and Mary isn't like, oh, shoot. She's just like, hold on, let me grab Jesus. <laughs> it might not be in the Bible exactly what happens before there that lets her know if there were, like, were there many miracles around the house, or... <laughs> but Mary clearly knows something. Yeah. She knows that something is up because when the time comes, she knows, hey, about time for Jesus to make his stamp in the world. I want to mention one more uh, person in this early church uh, evolution. And this is Pope Leo the Great. Pope Leo is way uh, into the 5th century. Probably most famous today historically because it was Pope Leo who convinced Attila the Hun 
to, you know, leave Rome alone. It's pretty good. I didn't know until it, but he sounded mean. So Pope Leo uh, has some historical significance, but he is also a doctor of the church. He wrote the definitive statement on this whole question of who is Jesus. The theology that we have today largely comes from a document that Pope Leo wrote in 449 called the Tome. And that Tome was the basis of the Council of Chalcedon in 451, which sort of definitively settled the matter of was Jesus human, was he divine? What does it mean to say he has two natures, fully human and fully divine? Put all of those things together. It is probably the most famous classical statement of Christology that we have in the church today. And I love it because it gives us an insight into how far the early church had come. We have Leo's Tome uh, still today. And these are just a couple highlights. I like the middle one most. Uh, for we could not overcome the author of sin and death unless he has taken our nature and made it his own. He being Jesus, sorry. For we could not overcome the author of sin and death unless Jesus had taken our nature and made it his own. To make sure that we understand how this worked, Leo says the properties of each nature, his human and his divine, were preserved in their totality. They came together to form one person. Humanity was assumed by majesty, weakness by strength, mortality by eternity. Not mixed together like Kool-Aid, entirely human and entirely divine, of two natures. Jesus didn't shut off his divinity to suffer on the cross. He did it as fully God and fully man. He didn't shut off his humanity so that he could, you know, turn the loaves and fishes into, well, I guess there were more loaves and fishes, you know the miracle. Um, he didn't turn off his humanity to do that. He was entirely human and entirely divine at all times. Thus, there was born true God in the entire and perfect nature of true humanity, complete in his own properties, complete in ours. Every bit human, every bit divine. That's what we believe today, right? More than 1,500 years later, after five centuries of wrestling over how do we understand Jesus, of being in houses and praying together and saying, help us to understand Jesus better, of having to write to each other and say, here's why I don't think that makes sense, of having the most educated people in the world say, uh, think about this. Pope Leo the Great writes the Tome and says, complete in his own properties, complete in ours. And that gives power to everything that we celebrate today. What should we learn from the early Christians? 2,000 years later, now that church teaching is much more established and defined, I think that it is our tendency to uh, immediately want to win an argument. And certainly the truth is important. However, I think that when we look back to the experience of the early Christians, one thing that we can learn is the value of the struggle, the value of the wrestling match to see why does that person see that thing that they do. That person may be atheist today, they may be uh, Protestant today, they may be a struggling Catholic today, and when they say to me, you know, I just, I just don't believe this, or this doesn't make sense, the recitation of church teaching certainly has a role. But what we don't often do well is listen and consider, what is the worldview behind that uh, position? We don't often take a moment to consider, what would people in the early church have experienced, and how is that an honest question that I can try to see uh, a broader perspective from? The early Christians would not have as easily been able to rely on uh, generations of writings, of course. They wouldn't have easily been able to bring in an expert. They would have had to wrestle with that personally. The more that we can wrestle personally with who is Jesus to me, what does it mean to say that Jesus saves me, how do I understand the love and the sacrifice of Jesus, the more that those things become personal, 
the more that they inform the way that we live our lives, the more that they inform our charity and our unity and our hospitality, and the more that we start to convert people as much with our lifestyle as with our uh, theology and beliefs. So uh, much to learn from the early Christians. I often uh, think we all should have the chance to experience the early uh, Catholic community for at least a part to understand how fortunate we are to have this immense deposit of faith upon which we can rely today. So uh, with that, uh, questions first? Is that the point? Yeah. I do believe that Jesus is God and, um, and human. But there's always been one uh, saying of Jesus that really was confusing to me, and that's when he says he does not, I can't quote it exactly, but he does not assume equality with the Father, mm -hmm. and that always confused me. Yeah, so, so the question was about assuming equality with the Father, and I do think we have to keep in mind that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, while one, still have distinct, um, I always use the word roles with the students, and I don't love it, but it's easier for them, that it's not that Jesus and the Father are not equal per se, maybe equal in stature or power or eternity, but but distinct nevertheless. It's the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so I think what most scholars would say is that we would interpret that as Jesus saying, while the Father and I are one, we're still distinct. Yes, sir. Uh, how close was Adam to be the perfect representation of man. Uh, and as soon as I said it now, I think I know the answer. You want to give it? Sounds good. Well, Adam was created by God. He was not with God in the beginning. So that's why Adam, being the first creation, could still sin because he was not uh, always, he was created by the Creator. And so that's why he still had the ability to sin, unlike Jesus, who we often call the new Adam. All questions directed up there from now on. That's, <laughs> that's beautiful. Very true. Very true. Yeah, the difference between creature and creator would be the difference there. How close, you know, it's a complicated question. People will ask sometimes, maybe I shouldn't say people as much as 17 year olds in great thinkers class, but they'll say, well, if God didn't want Adam to eat of the tree of knowledge, here's an idea. Why not keep it out of the garden? Like, what? <laughs> would have been easier, right? But that, that goes to the entire idea of free will. And if, in fact, God is love, and love is the freely chosen desire to want what's best for another person, then that tree has to be there for there to be love at all. For there to be any sort of love, that tree has to be there. That doesn't mean that God wanted Adam to sin, or, knew, quote, knew that Adam would sin, if you mean, like, predetermined it. I don't think that's what they mean. I think what it means is God created us to love, and had to allow for the possibility, and unfortunately, that's what happened. Yes, sir? Do you think that the division in the church from the early time on is for the purpose of strengthening it? And then, what about the division that we face today? Yeah. That's a great question. So I think, I think it's a, the question, the difference between doubt and obstinate. So, I think doubt, most of the time, is a healthy thing. So if you've ever, uh, well, I bet a lot of us have gone through confirmation, but if you have a, a child or a relative who is in the confirmation process, often, often adolescents will say, well, I don't know if I should be confirmed because I'm not sure that I believe everything. I say all the time, well, <laughs> sounds like exactly the kind of person who should be confirmed. That says, I need the Holy Spirit. I'm still looking for answers. Are you open to the truth? Is the Catholic Church the vehicle through which you hope to find the truth? And are you willing to keep working? Then the Holy Spirit's for you. I would say division in the church is never intended 
but it can be healthy insofar as people who are discussing the matter are open to the truth. When it becomes a matter of, I need to be right, I want to be the guy who gets credit for solving this problem, I know better than 2,000 years of church elders and certainly everybody else, then it's more obstinance than, than doubt. And so I think you have people who certainly they want a certain thing to be true because it will allow them to live a certain way or to not have to worry about a certain teaching. Uh, I would consider that obstinance. Doubt says, I'd love to believe I'm still in the struggle of figuring it out for myself. Obstinate says, I know way better than God. Um, I've always been interested in the early church and how it would be affected. Is there more historical evidence uh, from Apocrypha or other secular writings which could shed light on how uh, these people were thinking? That's a good one. Um, so, really written history, uh, outside of the writings of these people themselves and or sometimes the people who are on the other side, is somewhat limited, depending on who you are. We, don't, we just don't have a lot about Irenaeus himself, except for uh, from some of the people who would have come after him and been supporters of his position. So there is, but it's pretty inconsistent in the early church when it comes to just how much we can say about some of these uh, people who really formed early church teaching. We, we certainly know that they existed. We have them on plenty of lists from inside and outside of the church. We know their writing, and we have, we have, for some of them, we have volumes of letters. They still discover it. One thing I love about the world that we have is with all the technology we have, it's like every couple of years you'll just read like, oh, they were in some random library in the middle of Europe, and they discovered this whole volume of letters. They didn't think they had anything left from Athanasius, and now we just found 200 more letters. It's like, what? what? And then I go to our library upstairs, and I think, yeah, that's about right. <laughs> some of those books haven't been checked out since probably about the third century. <laughs> yes? I just have a question about St. Philomena. We had just went to the National Shrine over there. She was the 13-year-old martyr. Yep. It was about the late 200s. Is that right? She was 13 years old? Sounds right. Okay. So, curious on the time. I'm always fascinated with numbers. Do you have any other information about how many Christians there were? That's just to help give a perspective on what... I don't know. I don't. Okay. I would say this. Um, by the late 200s, you would have been talking about Christianity having reached most of Europe. I mean, not to say that it would have been the predominant uh, view in many communities, but certainly by, by the 200s, Christianity, uh, the Catholic faith would have reached northern Germany. We know, of course, that it was in France. Um, I think we have archaeological evidence for sure on the British islands. So you're talking about most of the the... Roman Empire and its surroundings, uh, but in terms of, of census, I, that would be outside my realm. A question, Mike. Uh, they often say that the Catholic Church today looks nothing like the Catholic Church of these first few centuries. How would you answer that? Yeah. Um, So, yes, but I don't think there's any way to get around the fact that having been, especially in the Western world, having been probably the predominant influence for 1,700 years changes our worldview, right? I mean, the fact that the Roman Catholic Church has had such a mark on every area of music, art, scholarship, everything you can think of. It's probably in some ways difficult for us to wrap our head around that feeling of being other, that feeling of really being outside of the mainstream, except that's exactly what we've come back to. I mean, we've really come back to a point that to really be Catholic in today's day and age is to be necessarily other. It can't, if you're blending in, you're probably doing it wrong. Right? We're supposed to stand out 
because it's so radically different than a world that is just based on materialism. It's so radically different than a world that is just based on, I don't, this, this is going to sound more critical than it intends to, but some of my fellow Christian brothers and sisters who the only question is, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus because if so you're saved, that's just not me. That's just not us. There's not a night that I go to bed and think like, I talked about Jesus tonight, I'm going to heaven if tonight's the night. <laughs> no! I toss and turn every night thinking, boy, I have hope. I have hope that Jesus' premise for me is real, but I better work harder tomorrow. Right? I mean, isn't that the essence of our faith? To say, it's not just about me, it's about us, and I'm not there yet. It's a journey, and I'm still going. I think the early Christians would have known that incredibly well. I think they would have known that feeling of, I have to be radically different from people around me or I'm doing it wrong. So while in a lot of ways we have the privilege of a lot of things that the early church didn't have, including lots of scholarship and theology, at the core, in a lot of ways, we're right back to the way Catholicism was in, in the early church. We're right back to this struggle to be radically different in a community that's pulling you and saying, no, just just be quiet and be like the rest of us. So, I don't know if that's an answer, but... Yes, sir, scholar. Couldn't give me a complex. <laughs> <laughs> um, take your moment, hang on. Okay, today, in our world, we have what we call Google. I've heard but of it. Back in the early church, stop and think, why would the churches have had big windows and big artworks and things like uh, visuals? Because if I couldn't read, if I didn't have a book, I could look at a picture and say to my friend, oh, this one is of the nativity. There was a star involved. There were shepherds. There was a manger. There was all of these things involved. And then as we got more and more sophisticated artists, like, say, Michelangelo, and he would put little bitty things in there that we, in our day, don't notice, but they probably did and say, ah, but there's a little... See, this drop of blood looks different than another drop because such and such. See how crooked his fingers look. This is a, an expression of uh, something or other, a special virtue, possibly. So they did have resources back then, and it was the art in the church, I believe, that made it uh, so uh, uh, dominant, so, so prevalent, and like I say, we go to look up things, that's where they went. They went to their church, and because they were so big, they had to look up. And what would they see? Father Barron talks about this rose window in this uh, cathedral, I believe it's in all around. And every day for a week or two, he just sat for, and watched the sun turn the color of that window and how much he gained from just looking at the window and how much the early church probably used this artwork for the same purpose. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be said for that and I'm gonna put in a plug for uh, uh, Craig and Ticelli's book. Uh, so uh, they mentioned in the book, the, the foundational truth in that is that when you talk about the different ways that we can, quote, prove or give evidence that God exists, one of the most overlooked one, I think, in all of, of uh, Christian history is beauty. Is the idea that for many of us, the moment that we experience God is when we're overwhelmed by beauty. And that can be man-made art. It can be looking through the stained glass window or coming upon a work of Michelangelo and being so moved that you feel like you're touching something that's more eternal. Or it can be in nature. It can be that experience when you're sitting at the lake and you're overlooking the sun as it's rising uh, over the lake and you're thinking to yourself, like, this is too beautiful to be the random collision of atoms. This is 
too transformative to me to be just coincidence, right? That's a that's a scholarly argument for God's existence, and you're totally right. I think I think we should also mention uh, the earliest church had to grow into that, of course. The earliest, earliest art would have been cave drawings, which I'm sure were very nice for the time, but <laughs> something tells me Michelangelo would have turned his nose up at those. Uh, in regards to the art, um, which our scholar was just talking about, um, I know, like in the early church, they used a lot of art to tell the story because the literacy rates were so low, yeah. and so that was a way to evangelize and inspire and um, bring people to it because they weren't able to read. So just a little side note on that. Yeah, half the reason why so many of our symbols for Jesus are symbols and not his name. Illiteracy and the fact that you keep it more secret from the Romans. Yeah. One of the questions you said um, to know the faith you share is who is Jesus? Um, in the Alpha program that um, is supposed to be doing in a lot of our parishes, that is one of the questions who is Jesus? And um, to share a story. Um, when you know who Jesus is, you can share that story and that love. Um, and through him you will, you will love um, to go back to the first steps to, sh to show um, what was it that you said, to show hospitality to one another and kindness and love. But when I'm finding out um, in our churches, I feel like our churches are becoming divided. Like you're either all Catholic or you're becoming cafeteria Catholics. You pick and choose. Um, how do you, how do you, how do you share, it's, to me it's easier to go share your faith with somebody that's not Catholic than somebody who is. Yeah. Some, I mean, and, and it's so sad that I have to share my faith with another Catholic. We should all be on the same page. Um, and, and, and I facilitate a Bible study in my parish, and I was pretty much tormented last week by a gentleman, and he went to 12, 12 years of Catholic school, and, and to be told some things that, um, or to be even asked things like that, how, how, do, you sh how do you share your faith with, I mean, these early Christians didn't go and say, you got to do this, 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 this. They, they showed their love and their hospitality, and through that they were changing the Romans. They died for their faith. I mean, I, sometimes I would like to ask one of these cafeteria Catholics, would you die for your faith today if you had to? Because um, so fr I'm so frustrated. I get so frustrated in my own church that I have to do this over and over again. And I'm a new Catholic. I've only been Catholic since 2013. So it's very, it's, it's, it's hard enough I want to go to my Protestant friends and family, but I have to catechize Catholics. And uh, it's very frustrating. So I may not answer that question. <coughs> Probably all of us have had the experience at some time in our life of being in relationship with someone and you just want them to love you more or love you better or love you differently. And in that moment, it's incredibly frustrating. I think one of the most challenging things about being Catholic today is that we have this wrestling match to measure my Catholicism and yours. <clears throat> to measure what is enough. What is an acceptable amount of doubt and when does it become like, and this is, I'm only gonna tell you how I look at it. If you kneel down next to me at mass, whether you believe 99% <coughs> the same as I do or 29%, if you're coming to worship at the Catholic Church and I'm coming to worship at the Catholic Church and we're both trying our best to love Jesus and know Jesus better through the church, then come kneel next to me and let's keep praying. Because I'm not there and I'm going to guess that you're not there and I hope that tomorrow I can get closer and you can get closer with me. But 
I think what happens to us a lot of times is we've convinced ourselves that these people are, are just not, right? They're not there or they're not, quote, really Catholic. And I get that. I do. And there comes a point where you can say you're Catholic, but you're not. Like you, can, you can say you're Catholic, but if you don't believe in the Eucharist and you don't believe in Jesus and you don't believe in God, you're not Catholic. <laughs> But I think that's for that person to evaluate. It's not for me to evaluate where a person is on their faith journey. One of the hardest parts about teaching theology in a Catholic high school is I have, I have young people who come from amazing homes who are unbelievably faithful, who every day I see them and I think I would love to have half the faith that you do. I have people who come from great homes great Catholic homes who have no faith and I think your parents must be ready to strangle me. <laughs> I, have, I have believers who come from homes that don't have faith and I have passionate atheists who come from homes that don't have faith. And all I know is all of us are waking up tomorrow and trying to figure it out. So I'll pray next to you. I'll kneel next to you. If you want to find God through the Catholic faith, and I know I do, I will pray next to you and for you for as long as it takes. And I pray to God that I never say to myself, I'm more Catholic than she is, or I'm a better Catholic than he is, because all I know is I'm not there yet. And there was a time in my life.